Welcome everyone to 10.4 Areas and Lengths in Polar Coordinates. Uh, in this video, we're going to do exactly what the title says, right? We're going to apply an area formula um, and a arc length formula uh, when our equations are given to us in polar coordinate form. So let's get to it with a nice theorem. So suppose the boundary of our region R is given by some polar equation, R is a function of theta. The area, which we're calling A, of our region R is given then by A equals the integral from A to B of 1 half of f of theta quantity squared. And now the A and B are chosen here so that we go around the region exactly once. Another way we could write this is the area is the integral from A to B of 1 half R squared d theta. And that looks like I forgot my d theta back here. Okay, so it's just an integral. Um, however, when we do these integrals, quite often we get cosine squareds or sine squared. So it's a good idea to remember how do we integrate cosine squared or sine squared. So for this, I want to recall our power reduction formula. So this is back from the good old chapter seven when we were doing trig integrals. Uh, we used this when we had cosines or sines or even powers, right? So cosine squared theta is one half times one plus cosine of two theta. And sine squared theta is the same as one half times one minus cosine of two theta. So these are our power reduction formulas and they will come up quite often in the following examples. So we want to find the area enclosed by a cardioid r equals two times one plus cosine of theta. So for this, we're gonna do our area is equal to the integral from zero to two pi. That's once around this cardioid. I'll draw a picture here in a little bit. One half times r. Well, r in this case is given by two times one plus cosine theta. We want to square all of that and we're integrating with respect to theta. So now we're gonna go ahead and simplify. The first thing is that when I square two, I get four, take one half of that, I get two. And when I square one plus cosine theta, well, I have to foil this all out. I get one plus two cosine theta plus cosine squared theta. Now I can integrate one and I can integrate cosine theta, but how do I integrate cosine squared theta? Well, that's where our power reduction formula comes in useful. So before I integrate, let's actually take a line to simplify down a little bit. So the first thing is that two times one is two, two times two cosine theta is four cosine theta, and then instead of two cosine squared theta, I'm gonna go ahead and swap that out for one plus cosine of two theta. All right, and now, uh, why don't we go ahead and integrate? So when I integrate two with respect to theta, I get two theta. When I integrate cosine, it gives me sine. Of course, I have the four along for the ride here. When I integrate one, I get theta. And when I integrate cosine of two theta, I get sine of two theta, but I need a one half, right? Because of the chain rule. I'm evaluating from zero to two theta. So now when I plug in zero into all of these cases, I get out zero. So when I plug in two pi, I get four pi plus, oops, sorry about that. And sine of two pi is just zero. So that's gonna give me zero here. And then two pi, and then sine of four pi, well, that's the same thing as zero. So altogether, my answer is six pi. So now I have a quick remark down here that says, don't forget symmetry is your friend. Oops, sorry, you can't really see it. Let me just scroll down a little bit for you here. Don't forget symmetry is your friend. So what do I mean by that? Well, in this case, it was quite easy to figure out the area, but there are often cases where we can use symmetry to our advantage. So for instance, if I was to sketch out this cardioid, and let me do it quite, quite quickly, I'm gonna just plot four points. So if I plug in theta is zero, theta is pi over two, well, and theta is pi over two, cosine is zero, so that's gonna be two times one is two. Same thing for theta is negative pi over two. And then finally, when theta is pi, uh, we get zero. So if you were to sketch a few more points, uh, we would get a shape that looks like this. It's cardioid, it looks kind of like uh, a heart, right? So cardio. Um, now, so instead of integrating from zero to two pi to get the area of this entire structure, the claim is that we could have only looked at this top piece right here. 
which would be as if we had integrated from zero to pi and then doubled it, right? So this is two times, and then we use our area formula d theta. Now again, in this case, it didn't really make much of a difference, but we'll certainly see some cases coming up where using symmetry will significantly simplify uh, our process. So let's go to our next problem. We need to think about intersecting functions when it comes to polar equations. It turns out uh, that it's not as straightforward as you might hope. So we're going to look at the functions r equals 2 cosine theta and r equals 2 sine theta. Theta is going to be ranging from 0 to pi. And my first thing is that I want to go ahead and graph these things. Graph them on the same axis below. So uh, I'm going to try to do this without a table. I'm just going to go ahead and start plotting points. So first along with the 2 cosine theta. If I plugged in theta is 0, I would get 2. Likewise, with the 2 cosine theta, if I plugged in pi over 6, if I plugged in pi over 6, right, my cosine of theta would be root 3 over 2. Multiply that by 2, that's going to be around 1.7. If I plugged in pi over 4, that would give me around 1.4-ish. If I plugged in pi over 3, well, 2 times cosine of pi over 3, 2 times 1 half, well, that's exactly 1, actually. Now when I plug in pi over 2, well, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Multiplied by 2 is still 0. And now it's where it gets fun, right? So if I plug in 2 pi over 3, well, cosine of 2 pi over 3 is going to be negative 1 half. So if I multiply that by 2, I'm going to get negative 1. So if I'm looking in the 2 pi over 3 direction, I need to go backwards 1. So that gives me this point. How about uh, if I were to stare off in the 3 pi over 4 direction? Right? So 2 times cosine of 3 pi over 4, that's going to be 2 times negative root 2 over 2. That's going to be negative root 2 or negative 1.4-ish. So I need to step backwards 1.4. Then we can kind of see the pattern. I'm going to need to step backwards 1.7 when I'm looking in the 5 pi over 6 direction. And then finally, when I'm looking in the pi direction, I need to step backwards too. So this gives me a circle, a nice complete circle when I go from 0 to pi. Now, let's go on to our second function, 2 sine theta. So when I plug in 0 for theta, well, sine of 0 is 0, so I get 0. And how about sine of pi over 6? Well, that's going to be 1 half times 2 is going to be 1. And I go on plotting these points, plugging in the values for theta, doubling them. So we've actually seen this graph before. We've already graphed 2 sine theta previously. So hopefully this looks exactly the same as what we did before. Uh, back, we actually transformed this into Cartesian coordinates and everything as well. OK, so how would the picture look if you had graphed from 0 to 2 pi rather than 0 to pi? right? So if I had continued, so let's go 1 beyond, right? So if I had gone 7 pi over 6, well, sine of 7 pi over 6 is going to be negative 1 half times 2 would be negative 1. And it turns out we're going to map over all of these same points just a second time. So we don't gain anything by going from 0 to 2 pi. Now, there are certainly polar equations where you do gain more points by going from 0 to 2 pi, like in the case of the cardioid. But for these functions right here, 0 to pi gives you the entire shape. So my answer to part b is the exact same. right? Uh, you wouldn't get any different picture, but every point would be represented twice. So certainly when you're doing stuff like arc length, for instance, you really wouldn't want every point to be represented twice. You'd only want it to be represented once. You'd be kind of doubling up your arc length. So it doesn't come up a lot right now, but you have to be careful what your range should be. In this case, it should just be 0 to pi. It gives you the entire shape, and you don't want to go any more than that. Part C, find all r theta values where these two functions intersect. So let's go ahead and set these functions equal, right? That's a good way to figure out where these things intersect. And again, we're looking between theta is 0 to pi. So, well, if I go ahead and divide both sides by 2 cosine theta, I get tangent of theta equals 1. So when does the tangent of theta equal 1? 
Well, on this interval, the only point is when theta equals pi over 4. So now if I go ahead and I plug that into either of my functions, I'm going to get r equals 2 times cosine of pi over 4. Well, that's going to be root 2 over 2. So that's going to be r equals root 2. So my theta r value combination should be pi over 4 comma root 2. And hopefully if we look at our graph, let me kind of move this up a little bit. If we look at our graph, hopefully we should recognize, hey, these things intersect at pi over 4. And indeed they do. There's the purple point where they intersect. But now looking at this, they also intersect at 0, 0. Why didn't I get that? Where does this come from? So the claim is, is that in polar coordinates, this is not really a point of intersection, right? So for our sine function, it hits the origin when theta is 0 and pi. But for our cosine function, it hits the origin when theta equals pi over 2. So although they both hit the origin, they hit at different theta values. So the origin's kind of unique in this regard, because it doesn't matter in which direction you're looking. When r equals 0, you're at the origin. However, when you look at d, right, find all x, y values where these functions intersect, well, then you definitely need to include 0, 0, right? Because they intersect at the origin, and then they also intersect at one other point. So luckily, we have a way to transform between polar points and Cartesian points, right? So x is r cosine theta. So r is root 2. And then cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. So therefore, we get 2 over 2, which is 1. And then also y is r sine theta. So r and then sine of pi over 4, so we have root 2 times root 2 over 2, which also gives us 1. So this point, and of course we can verify with the graph, is 1, 1. All right, so if we're looking for the x, y points of intersection, we have 0, 0 and 1, 1. All right, now part E, we want to calculate the area shared by these two circles. So here is the region shared by the two circles. I'd like to calculate out the area of this thing. Well, again, symmetry is our friend, right? So instead of calculating out the area of all of this, which I claim would be a bit of a pain, I'm only going to calculate out the area of half of it, right? The stuff below this line, which happens to be the line pi over 4. And if I can calculate out the area of half of it, well, then I can double it, and that'll give me the area overall. Okay, so I'm going to do the area from 0 to pi over 4, and I'm going to double it. So I'm going to have a 2 here. And then my area formula is 1 half the radius squared. So which radius am I using? Well, it looks like I'm going to be exiting out this green circle. The green circle happened to be the 2 sine theta. Okay. So 2 sine theta, that's my radius, squared, d theta. So of course, the 2 and the 1 half kind of cancel. And I can take out, well, 2 squared is going to be 4. So I'm going to get 4, uh, the integral from 0 to pi over 4 of sine squared, d theta. And now look at this. It looks like we need our power reduction formula yet again. So sine squared is the same thing as 1 half times 1 minus cosine of 2 theta. So that 4 and the 1 half gives us the 2. And now when I integrate, I have theta minus 1 half sine of 2 theta, thanks to the chain rule. And now I need to evaluate from 0 to pi over 4. Now when I plug in 0 into either of these things, I get 0. So if I plugged in pi over 4, I'd get 2 times pi over 4 minus 1 half. And then sine of pi over 2, right, because I have to double it, is going to be 1. So it looks like my final answer is going to be pi over 2 minus 1. And remember, I already doubled it, right? So this is the area of the entire region shared by the two circles, not just half of it. All right, so there's where I doubled. Uh, really quick, let's go back and reflect of how much it would have been a pain to go ahead and calculate out the area regularly, right? So if I hadn't pulled off the symmetry trick, I would then have to also integrate from pi over 4 to pi over 2, where the bounding function in this case would be 2 cosine theta. So I'd have to do double the work, essentially.
All right. Well, that was certainly a doozy of a problem, but I hope you got a lot from it. Let's go ahead and take a quick break. When we come back, I get a little more area, and then we'll do some arc length problems. All right. I'll see you shortly.